Let me give a little intro to Paul so people know his background. So he's a reporter for the Wall Street Journal. I think everyone uh, knows that, currently covering uh, cryptocurrency and, and blockchain-related uh, technologies. Uh, Paul has co-authored uh, two uh, books with Michael Casey. Uh, the first is called The Age of Cryptocurrency, um, and the second is called The Truth Machine, uh, the blockchain and future of everything. Something even more impressive, though, if, if that wasn't impressive enough, Paul is the Wall Street Journal's Walking Dead columnist and author of Guts, The Anatomy of the Walking Dead. So, um, yeah, that's a... That's the a, after conference can be about the Walking Dead. Exactly, exactly. Right, the questions that are going to come up on Glitter <laughs> are going to be fascinating. Um, so let's, let's get to the questions. Um, season 6, Episode 7. Okay. <laughs> Glenn is on the top of the trailer, falls into the mosh pit of... He's dead. He's dead. He's dead. Okay, I don't good. want to hear it. I don't Thank want to you. hear that he survived. Great. Perfect. All right. Now okay. to the next best question. All right. Next All right. Yeah. Uh, let's get into uh, cryptocurrency. First question that, that I always think about is, will is it, is it sort of inevitable right. that some form of cryptocurrency is going to become mainstream and and if so you know sort of do you have a, a potential timeline on, right. on how long you think that might take I think I, I don't think it's inevitable I think it's very likely and probable I don't think it's inevitable I think at some point what is inevitable is that we will largely and really to an extent we have it now I think it's funny because Bitcoin came along and it was so viral and it had such an aura about it that people thought it really was something extremely different. Mm -hmm. It's not extremely different. It is essentially electronic money, digital money. The, the real difference is how the system is set up, and the system is set up to cut out middlemen, cut out banks, cut out central banks. So that's the, the real sort of twist and the difference on, on it. Whether that system becomes widespread and mainstream, mm -hmm. I don't think that's inevitable. I think it's probably going to happen. I don't think it's inevitable. Yeah. But I do think inevit what is inevitable is that we are going to have some form of digital money. Mm -hmm. And I say that, actually, as a guy who still likes cash. So I don't say that enthusiastically, but realistically, I do think we are moving towards a world where more and more, and it's happening. I mean, more and more people are comfortable using their phones and their mobile wallets. We are moving in that direction. How that will all be constructed is still up in the air. Yep. No. And, and you mentioned in, uh, in both your books, and in particular the last one, that um, you know, cryptocurrency isn't new. It's, it's now a, a sort of a 10-year-old uh, yeah. or so um, technology. But, but where, do you, where do you think we are in the sort of life cycle or, of, of cryptocurrency sure. and or blockchain? Because they are so tightly managed. Right. So, so 10 years ago, in October, uh, Halloween in the U.S., uh, October 31st, 2008, 10 years ago, someone calling themselves Satoshi Nakamoto releases a white paper describing what becomes Bitcoin. And the concepts that make that system work have come to be called blockchain technology. So we're about 10 years from that event. Mm -hmm. And I think w when you look at Bitcoin, a lot of people will say, oh, it's just like the dot-com, uh, Bitcoin and blockchain, the whole thing. They'll say, oh, this is just like the dot-com era. And I think they have that right and wrong. I think you have to look at it on three different levels. The hype cycle, we are definitely at peak dot-com levels. I mean, this is, you know, uh, anybody who was in New York last week knows that the hype cycle is, is off the charts. The investment cycle, I don't think we're at peak dot-com levels quite yet. A lot of money is going into this sector, but compared to what was going into the tech sector in the height of the dot-com, it, it's nothing. The development, the development timeline, which is really what you're asking yep. about. Uh, when people say this is just like dot-com, I think they're getting it wrong. Mm -hmm. You look at the history of the internet, the internet was started in 1969 by a bunch of scientists in a lab. You know, I mean, it was a very small project. That was 1969. By 1979, 10 years later, how many people had heard of the internet? Or ARPANET, which was you know, like nobody. So I think when you look at the development of, of Bitcoin and blockchain, it is very, very early days. Uh, it's gotten a little more accelerated because of the hype, because of the money. So, you know, the, the development timelines of the Internet and Bitcoin may not be matching up exactly. Yep. Bitcoin may be a little more advanced. But, I mean, this may be the 80s for Bitcoin. This may be the early 80s for Bitcoin. You still don't have 
very easy user interfaces. You still don't have a lot of the, the sort of back-end infrastructure. Keep in mind, there are about 500 volunteer developers working on Bitcoin as a project yeah. around the world. Microsoft might have that many working on a word. Right. I mean, so it's the development of Bitcoin and blockchain technology, which is what is really important. Yep. That is still extremely nascent, extremely early. Okay, excellent. Um, and, and so as a rating agency and a lot of our, our um, the counterparts that we deal with uh, on the investor side, we're always focused on risk, you know, where, right. where are things bad? But, but obviously, um, you know, uh, cryptocurrency and, and blockchain are getting the attention that they are mainly for the good things that they can potentially do. So maybe um, talk about a, a, maybe a couple of uh, examples of, sure. of how cryptocurrency and blockchain might be right. helpful, and, and I both from the financial and maybe other, other I think aspects. The, the biggest thing to keep in mind about all of this is not a lot of the, the technical logistics, the real minutia of it, because you can get lost in that. And what is really important is that what this system promises is basically transparency. Mm -hmm. It is a way to maintain a database over a network of computers that no one person is the only controller of that network. No one person is the only central point of failure of that network. And it allows you to have a, just more transparency into a transaction history, because that's all it really is. It is a database that keeps a record of transactions. That's what Bitcoin is, that's what all these blockchain pro uh, projects are. So can that have some value to the financial infrastructure, the global financial, financial infrastructure that we have? I think it can. I think it's also important to keep in mind that you'll hear a lot of people hype this up and they talk, and they, you know, these very breathless terms. Mm -hmm. This is not a panacea. Mm -hmm. If everyone in the world gets their mind on a specific trade that they think is going to make them rich and they all pile into it and that trade goes south and it goes belly up, you are still going to have a lot of people lose money. Mm -hmm. What you might not have is the kind of panic you had in 2008 when nobody knew whether these assets were worth a dollar, a thousand dollars, nothing. Nobody knew what the, what was on the bank balance sheets and I know none of the banks want to, you know, reveal their balance sheets, but you, you wouldn't you might not have a situation where in 2008 you had these so-called level three assets, these hard to value assets because they didn't trade often, they were illiquid. Yep. And everybody panicked because they didn't know how many of those anybody had and what they were worth, and, every, and everything froze. You might not have that because you will have a little more transparency, you will have a little more insight into the system. And what you might also have is, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking 10, 20 years down the road, and you have to keep in mind that all of this has to be predicated on the idea that we're looking 10, 20 years down the road. Right. You might have, if you have multiple blockchains, you have a blockchain that handles clearing and settlement. You have blockchains that are handling titles, you know, that are have been implemented in the real estate industry. Uh, so that you know, I mean, look, think about it, in 2008, you didn't know who had actual title to some of those houses that were the assets in those MBS. You might not have a situation like that. You might not have... We might not have robo-blockchain signing. It, yeah, right, right. right. exactly. Because it will be, right. it will so be verifiable it, to a much higher degree. It, it, it will not solve every problem. It will not keep people from making bad investments. It is mm -hmm. not going to, um, it's not going to mitigate human emotion. But it might mitigate some of that opacity that really, really ac exacerbated a lot of the problems we had in 2008. Yep. That's the real goal, I think, when financial institutions are looking at this technology. Yep. I, I thought it was interesting in, in your book when we talked about um, some specific applications and it really, you know, uh, both of cryptocurrency and of blockchain, and it was such, it was such a wide variance. I think you used an anecdote of a, you know, someone in uh, Afghanistan being underbanked um, and yeah. not having, and then the on the other side you had uh, sort of energy distribution uh, networks. Right. So may, maybe chat yeah. a little bit about those. Examples. Uh, right, we're, we're kind of at this stage. Um, is anybody here watch the show Portlandia? Good. Okay. <laughs> There, I'm there's your perfect. Good. I, I got one. Yeah, I got exactly. one. Yeah, All right, yeah. great. Uh, it's a sketch show, very funny. Do you know the the put a bird on it bit? Yes. Yeah. So there's yep. a bit where they they run this really kind of bad craft shop, um, secondhand shop, and they just paint a little blue bird on everything. And everything, their whole gimmick is put a bird on it, put a bird on it. You know, here's a cup, put a bird on it. We're at the stage where put a blockchain on it, it is everything. Everything is, you know, put a blockchain on it, put a blockchain on it. 
Uh, we're at that testing phase where they're trying to figure out where this technology is really going to work. It may not work for everything. It may be better in some cases than others. I, I think just looking at the securities industry, mm -hmm. very simply, uh, there is a lot of potential to implement blockchain-based networks where securities trading and clearing is handled on this kind of broad distributed database where when a trade goes through, you have the, the, the two parties, you don't necessarily need a counterparty because as soon as the trade goes through, uh, the money, you know, you kind of have to put up the money beforehand, right? right? <laughs> I mean, everything is verified beforehand. So yep. the, the trade, the clearing, the settlement, all of that is handled in one digitized transaction that takes a couple of, hopefully a couple of set seconds to clear. Mm -hmm. So you don't have a lot of money tied up in that sort of two or three day process where they're trying to clear the trade. It all happens very fast. Yep. That would be a great thing. Yep. Uh, if they can make that work, that would be a great thing. Mm -hmm. And you are starting to see a couple of projects on a very important one is the Australian Stock Exchange in December, after testing it for a couple of years, decided we are going to use a blockchain based system for clearing and settling that is going to replace the system we had in the 90s. So they have tested it. They think it's going to work. It's going to be really interesting to watch how the Australian Stock Exchange handles this technology. Yep. That's a key project to keep an eye on. Yep. Um, so that, 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 yep. that's a really yep. big one. Um, that, it's a, yeah, that's a, that's a huge application. And I think uh, you know uh, a couple of things you mentioned fall right into the panel uh, that Neb was leading in terms of some of these central centralized counterparties. I think with blockchain technology, there's um, so, uh, you know, significant potential for this to enhance the way they do business. Another question is whether they could just be disrupted. So right. the ETCC is, uh, you know, is a, a, an example, trust banks, right. you know, in general. Do, do you see that potential for, um, you know, for, for some of those entities to just sort of get left yeah, behind yeah. And, and replaced by something uh, new? Anybody here work for DTCC? I saw one badge outside. Okay. And no joke. Uh, so there might be, there, there were some people from the DTC sign. Okay, up. good. We're going to talk about right. that. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just, I'm kind of, I'm half kidding. Uh, I think a, three years ago really is when this started to be taken seriously in the financial sector. They started to say, let's, let's look at this technology. And I, at that time, I think a lot, the first place a lot of people turned was DTCC. We're going to put them out of business. So DTCC, I'm sure you all know about it, came about in, I think it was the early 70s, they, they came around. And there was a problem in the 60s where trading had exploded on Wall Street and they could not keep up with the trades. They couldn't settle them. They couldn't keep track of who had the stock certificates. You literally had guys riding around on bikes in Manhattan messaging st literal stock certificates all over town. DTC was created to be a central repository for all those stock certificates so that they didn't have to be messengered all over town. One group had them, one, keep, one group kept track of who owned them. In 2015, people thought, we're going to put DTCC out of business. This is going to be great. It's all going to be digitized. It's all going to be atomized. It's all going to be on a blockchain. All these records of who owns what. We're not going to need DTCC. I don't know that that's going to happen. And, and I have to say, uh, this is all evolving. Mm -hmm. But what I think you're going to see now is, rather than a business like DTCC disappear overnight and these functions taken over by some blockchain here, I think what you're probably going to have is a company like DTCC adopt the technology. Mm -hmm. uh, trust banks, custody banks adopt the technology. What that will probably mean is that a lot of the people who work for those banks, a lot of the back office functions, a lot of the accountants, a lot of the people who actually are in charge of their databases, they might be put out of business. You will probably see fewer and fewer people working in the financial securities industry on Wall Street. I don't know, though, that you're going to just see you know, institutions disappear overnight. Right. I, I'm starting to think that that, you know, that, that probably isn't going to happen. Yep, yep. Well, you could argue that it's, it's similar to um, Amazon and retail, right? Um, people go, well, I can right. get it on Amazon, right. every and, retail, and there's no use for retail. And, and there, even yeah. more to the point, um, depository, trust, clearing, incorporation, you know, the word trust right. is huge in this instance. You have to keep that in mind. The whole point of Bitcoin, they, they, 
they call it a trustless system. It isn't necessarily a trustless system. What you're putting your trust in is the program. Mm -hmm. If the program is solid, if the program works, if the transaction history is there, if it's never hacked, you're putting your trust in a program to work. Yep. Trust is huge, and I don't think you are going to get, certainly not banks, and probably a lot of investors, institu certainly institutional investors, mm -hmm. if not retail investors, trusting programs over institutions. So I think there still will be a role for a DTCC. Mm -hmm. There still will be a role for a trust bank. People want, at the end of the day, and I hate that cliche actually, <laughs> but I mean, at the end of the day, people want to have trust that their assets are where they are, what they think they are, that they can, just, they, they can get them if they need them. So there is still a role for financial institutions to play in guaranteeing that. Yep. Maybe 20 years, 20, 30 years down the road, if this technology does become widespread, if it does become mainstream, if it does become implemented, and you get an entire generation of people who have grown up with it, mm -hmm. they will get to the point where they, they say, oh, what do we need DTCC for? Yep. Maybe, but right now I think you'll probably have some combination of this technology providing some transparency, providing some speed and some, some lower costs, but you will still have financial institutions playing that role of the trusted provider. Yep. I think yep. that is what's going to happen. Yep. So, so w when I think about the, you know, the financial system um, and its reliance on sort of centralization and regula uh, regulation to create uh, trust mm -hmm. and, and comfort, and I think about the concept of blockchain, which is decentralization yeah. and deregulation, um, I keep on thinking, okay, how, do you, how can you fit the blockchain uh, technology into um, you know uh, uh, our modern day financial right. system. And um, ha have you seen any instances where uh, you mentioned the Australian Stock Exchange, but but any place else where um, they're trying to marry right. the the two, so within uh, a regulated environment? Yes, and I'll give you some examples. Yep. But before I even say that, I, I think what you're what you're hitting on is sort of a a a key. It's really a huge topic. I think over the next decade at least next decade, you're going to see a large clash between centralized and decentralized systems. Mm -hmm. Technology is making it very, very possible to run decentralized systems, and easy, and cheap, and, and very fast. And that's not going to go away, and people are going to take advantage of that. You are going to see this play out. This is gonna happen for at least the next five, 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and what I think you'll probably have is these You'll have decentralized networks and centralized networks operating in parallel, and it will be up to people to choose what they want to invest in, yep. where they want to put their money, their time, their assets. Yep. Uh, I think here in the U.S., to a large extent, and, and you see this playing out, you still have regulators trying to figure out what is this, mm -hmm. what do we want to do about it. What I do think we're past is the point where Lawmakers and regulators have that knee jerk, we don't understand this, we're gonna ban this. That reaction I think is gone. I think what you're seeing now is regulators and lawmakers try to figure out, can we, can we marry this de decentralized software with our centralized systems? Yep. Uh, an important place to watch, uh, and a couple of nations are further along than us in the US, which is why I mentioned us. Uh, Japan, I think is really fascinating. In 2014, the biggest Bitcoin exchange, Mt. Gox, based in Japan, blows up. Huge disaster. But the Japanese really, they had to, they had to mop it up. Mm -hmm. But in having to mop it up, they learned a lot about the technology. And what they have done over in the intervening years was they, f they came up with a way to make this work in, in a regulated environment. And in 2017, Japanese government puts in rules for Bitcoin. They, they put in rules of the road. They define it, they say what it is, they define how companies have to operate if they want to attract Bitcoin business, basically money transmitters. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they put in AML, know your customer, all those rules that normal banks have, they say to the Bitcoin exchanges and operators, if you want to attract this business, go ahead, because we have determined what this is. We know how this should operate, here are your rules. They implement it in 2017, in the spring of 2017, and as soon as they do it, Bitcoin trading takes off in Japan. Yep. And one thing I think is interesting is what they said basically in a nutshell is they, 
they recognized Bitcoin as a payment system. Mm -hmm. They didn't put it on a par with the yen. They didn't give it a, a title as an official currency. It's not a national currency. But they said this is a legitimate payment system. Mm -hmm. We're going to recognize it as such. Yep. So you saw Bitcoin businesses, services businesses come in trying to facilitate that trade. You saw retail businesses start to accept Bitcoin. And I think that's going to be a really fascinating experiment to watch how Bitcoin develops in an in, an, in a market, in a nation where they have recognized it as such. Right. So that's an important one to keep an eye on. Right, that they attempted to put some, some guard yeah. rails around it, but fit it into yeah. a, a, you know, an already established efficient And, and uh, Switzerland system. too. Switzerland's very positive yeah. on the technology, on the industry. Uh, they too have put in some rules around it. They've put in some definitions for securities, different types mm -hmm. of digital assets. They are trying to attract business. They see this as a competitive advantage. Yep. Can we attract capital? Can we attract talent to Switzerland to build these 21st century systems? Yep. Uh, so you're go I think you're actually one of the, you're going to see a lot of regulatory arbitrage among the regulators and lawmakers. Yeah. Some of them want to attract the business. Some of them want to shut it out. And you're going to see businesses go wherever they find the most favorable environment. Yep. That's going to be a really interesting dynamic to keep an eye on. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I do want to get back to the risk uh, side yeah. of this, though. Um, so I, I think it was Lisa who mentioned on the from the Fed on the last panel. Um, her um, uh, biggest concern, you know, from the Fed standpoint, is cyber risk uh, and the, the potential right. operational uh, controls there. Um, uh, you only mentioned the word hack so far <laughs> once uh, today, uh, but in, I think in, I'm about to mention it. Again. You are. You are in the in the the book. Um, uh, you state um, that the core Bitcoin ledger has never been hacked. Uh, and I, I was going to say, how how is that true, given all the things right. that we hear and Mt. Gox, you, right. you know, you imagine, and, and it, does that imply that risk is concentrated elsewhere within the, you know, cryptocurrency right. uh, system, the exchanges or something like that, that oh, well, we're not okay. thinking about? So, a couple of things. One, I will say it is not theoretically impossible to believe that the Bitcoin ledger itself could be hacked. In 10 years, though, it has not happened. And, and I'll kind of briefly, quickly try to Please. go into why that is. Uh, when you hear about Bitcoin hacks, what you're always hearing about is a, a, a service that got hacked. Mt. Gox was an exchange. Mt. Gox was not Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Mt. Gox was a private business running a trading platform. That got hacked. Um, a lot of, all of the hacks have been businesses that got hacked. No different than when Target got hacked, Home mm -hmm. Depot, JP Morgan. Anytime you have a, a centralized database of information operated by a centralized party, a company, you're going to have cyber thieves attempting to get into that. And that's what's happened in Bitcoin. What hasn't happened in Bitcoin is that the ledger itself, which has come to be called the blockchain, mm -hmm. the database history, the transaction history for Bitcoin, the entire 10-year transaction of every single Bitcoin that has changed hands, that ledger, that account has never been hacked. And the reason why is because, what I said at the beginning, when you operate this network, it is operated on a a network of computers. Every single computer running Bitcoin software has an identical copy of that transaction history. If you wanted to hack it, if you wanted to alter it, if you wanted to counterfeit Bitcoins, you would have to alter the history on every single computer. That is extremely expensive to do. Like I said, not impossible. But you would have to take control of at least more than half of all those computers. This is the fifty-one percent. The fifty-one percent yeah. attack, right? See, I read Anybody watch Silicon Valley? Okay. <laughs> all right, a couple Figures. guys. You saw that that yeah. they made a joke of that this yeah. season, yeah. right? Um, it is extremely difficult to do. Not impossible, but extremely difficult. And the the disincentive is by the time you spent all the money to get all that computer power you would have amassed so much Bitcoin that you, you would just be, you would be destroying whatever value right. you had gotten had by going into the system. So the whole idea is that there is a disincentive to even doing a 51% attack. Yep. If you were a state player and you wanted to just destroy Bitcoin and you didn't care how much money it cost you, could you do it? Mm -hmm. Ostensibly, yes, you could do it. But it would cost you a lot of money. Right. So the ledger itself is extremely stable because of the fact that every single computer on the network has an identical history. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty attractive thing. Yep. Uh, and you compare that to what we were talking about in, in the last panel, you know, cyber thieves going into 
centralized servers? Can you hack into JP Morgan? Can you hack into any bank, a trust bank? Can you destroy their history? Theoretically, yes. And if you do it, what are their redundancies? What are their backups? Well, in this case, the backup is everybody else on the network has the same transaction history. Mm -hmm. So, you know, hopefully that system, that's, that's sort of the core backup, that's the core redundancy, that's the core, core security promise of a blockchain-based system. Excellent, excellent. Well, I, I only have about 37 more questions to, uh, to uh, ask you, but I think that's a, a perfect place to, to end the discussion. Uh, great opportunities, um, but as investors, you also have to understand yeah. the, you know, the potentials for, uh, for risk. So Paul, thank you very much for your, your insight and, uh, and color into thank the exciting me. world of cryptocurrency.